In this special episode, we're going to have a look at macOS Big Sur on the Apple M1 chip. And there's going to be a lot of nuances with this because the chip architecture is the Apple M1. It is no longer an Intel or AMD processor. And the reason why that's a big deal is because a lot of binaries are compiled for the x86 64 chipset. And with Apple being on their own chip, that could cause some compatibility issues and in many cases preventing the applications from running. But the first thing that I want to do is try to get Homebrew installed. And did you know that you can go to railstore.com to get your own Ruby on Rails t-shirt or your Drift and Ruby t-shirt. So be sure to check that out and use the promo code Ruby for free shipping within the United States. So if I navigate to brew.sh, we could copy this command to get it to install. However, Homebrew does have some nuances with this and we actually need to run it under Rosetta. And so the easiest way to get an application to run under Rosetta within your terminal is to type arch x86 underscore 64 and then we can paste in or type in whatever command that we want to run on the x86 architecture. So in this case, I'll go ahead and paste in the installation script for Homebrew but I am pulling it from the master branch. Once I type in my password, it will go ahead and install the Xcode command line tools, and this will take a few minutes to do. And while it's installing, I'll go ahead and mention that I did do a Twitter thread with a list of discoveries that I found as I was preparing this episode, and I'll put a link to this in the show notes, but it might be worth a look, where I was able to get a lot of things up and running, but there were some things that just quite didn't work well. And another library that I really like to use is OhMyZSH, and I'm just going to paste in the installation script for that as well. And we can see that works without any issues. There is one additional step that we'll need to do, which if we run this comp audit, it'll show that there's some insecure directories. So we can just copy and paste this command to fix those issues. So next, I want to get off this terminal, and I want to install iTerm, so I'll just do a brew cask install iterm2. And this installation went through pretty smoothly. And once that's installed, we can go ahead and close terminal and we can launch iterm. And if we pull up our activity monitor and look at iterm, we can see that it's actually running on the Apple architecture. So it is natively supported under the Apple M1 chip. If we did have an application running that was not supported under the Apple M1 chip, and instead it was running under Rosetta, then we would see the architecture Intel or unknown here. And so let's go ahead and try and run Docker. I could do a brew install Docker, but immediately it says that it can't do that. And it gives us a alternative install, which I found doesn't work very well. So instead, similar to how we installed Homebrew, we could do an arc dash x86 underscore 64, and then a brew install Docker. And this will download and install Docker for us. And if we run Docker info, we'll see that the Docker daemon is not running. And that's because the Docker virtualization won't actually work on the Apple M1 quite yet. They're still working diligently to get it up and running and they want to make it a nice experience. But as for right now, it doesn't work. But as you can see, the CLI is working, which means that we could connect to a remote Docker instance so I'll type ssh-keygen to generate a RSA key pair. And so once that generates, I can then copy the SSH key with the SSH copy dash ID. I can input the file. It's going to be on my dot SSH at my home directory. And then I can copy it over to my remote server. And then I can export my Docker host and set this equal to the SSH, my username, at the IP address. Now if I run docker info, it gives me a lot more information and I can even do a docker run. I'll pass through the port 80 and we'll run the nginx. We can then go to the IP address of the remote docker server and we can see nginx is up and running. And so I know this isn't a great way to approach it, but if you're on the Apple M1 chip, then this might be able to help you get by until we have native Docker support, in which case we'll then have a whole different set of issues 
with the different kind of architectures on our development machine versus what we are deploying to. And so we do have Ruby installed by default, and it is a universal binary on the ARM64. But I don't really like using the system Ruby, so I'll do a brew install ASDF. And again, we got the issue where it won't install it on the ARM processor. So we do have to install the ASDF with Intel, and I'm getting tired of having to type arc dash x86 underscore 64 every time. So I'll edit my ZSH RC file, and I'll just create an alias, and I can make this alias anything, like an ibrew is equal to the arc dash x86 underscore 64, and then call brew. I can save this file, run source ZSHRC, and then I could do a ibrew install ASDF. And this again will take a few minutes to install. And once ASDF installs, we can inject a command into our ZSHRC file and then run source on the ZSHRC again. And then we can interact with ASDF and we can go ahead and install a plugin. We'll install the plugin Ruby and then we can point to the repository where it's hosted. You then run ASDF install Ruby 2.7.2 and the installation of OpenSSL failed. So I'm going to try to do an arc dash x86 underscore 64, and then the ASDF install Ruby 2.7.2. Once it's done installing, we can type ASDF global Ruby 2.7.2. And so now if we type Ruby dash version, we now have our Ruby 2.7.2. I'll go ahead and paste in a command so whenever we install gems, it won't install the documentation. And then we could do a gem install rails. And again, it will have to install some native extensions. But I found that once we get to this point, we don't really have to do anything else special with Rosetta, like specifying the architecture. We could also do a brew install node, which again, we'll then have to do an ibrew install node. And then we could do an npm dash g install yarn. We can go ahead and create a new Rails application. And before we create a new Rails application, I'm going to go ahead and install PostgreSQL. And again, we'll have to do it with an ibrew install PostgreSQL. And so I think the basic rule of thumb is if it doesn't install normally at first, then try specifying the architecture. Or if you've created an alias, then you can do that as well. I'll go ahead and start Postgres. And then I'll also go ahead and install Redis. Looks like we'll have to do an ibrew install Redis. And I'll go ahead and start the Redis service. And so I'm going to go ahead and start a new Rails application. And it'll install some additional gems. And once that's done, we'll change our directory. And I did forget to specify PostgreSQL. So I can run Rails DB system change dash dash two equals and then the PostgreSQL. I'll confirm the change in my database YAML file, and I'll run bundle to install the PG gem. Once that's done, I can run Rails generate scaffold. We'll create a users table with a first name and a last name. We can run Rails db create, db migrate to create our database and migrate. And then we can launch our Rails server. We can navigate over to our localhost port 3000 users, and we can create a test and it works. And I did check this, with doing Russian doll caching with Redis, and that works as well, and doing active storage uploads to our local also works. And I found that Visual Studio Code works well, as well as all the extensions that I use on a daily basis. Another install that I really like to use is Rectangle, which basically just allows me to move my windows around and have some nice global shortcuts that I'm able to use. And when we talk about performance, I did run a few different scenarios where on the M1, I ran a benchmark on calculating some Ruby hashes. I then used the system Ruby on the M1. So that'll be the second M1 arm. I have a baseline Mac Pro. And then I also tested this on a little bit older MacBook Pro. And so the blue bars represent one test that I did. And then the green bars represent a different test. So we can see that there definitely is a performance hit using the Ruby x86 on the L1. We don't get all the speed claims that a lot of other videos and articles are boasting, 
because there is some overhead here. However, if we look at the M1 ARM version, it hands down beat the Mac Pro and the MacBook Pro. On the second test and on the first test, it came right up close to them. And keep in mind that this is on an M1 chip, which is much cheaper, and it's the first rendition of these Apple Silicon processors. So ultimately, I think that if we get to a situation where the next generation is going to be even faster than this current generation, then it won't be too long before we see these processors hands down beating any Intel processor. But the real question is, should you go out and buy an M1 today? As it stands right now, if you have Docker or any kind of virtualization, either through VirtualBox, Parallels, or VMware, as a daily requirement for your development, then I would not go out and get a M1 computer today. However, if you don't have any of those requirements, then I think the performance for the dollar, the M1 is going to be a very solid choice. Keep in mind that this is their first generation of desktop processors, so there will be some other bugs that we uncovered down the road. And very likely next year, they will release an even better processor that will leave the M1 way behind. And so you may also wonder about the RAM. Because we are on a unified memory system, this is not an upgradable memory. I did opt for the 16 gigabyte version. And with this computer not being taxed at all, with just iTerm, Safari, the activity monitor itself, Visual Studio Code, Redis, the Rails service, and PostgreSQL up and running, you can see that I'm already using 9.38 gigs. And so I think if your application has any kind of demand on memory, you're going to be doing yourself a favor in the long run by getting the 16 gigabyte version. But in many cases, I think that the 8 gigabyte version, even though you will be using swap, these solid state drives are a lot faster than their predecessors. And the performance impact isn't what it quite used to be, like it was on spinning hard drives. And so personally, I will not be switching to the M1 yet as my daily driver. I will keep it around to test things as they come up. And if there's any kind of application that you have that you're wondering if it's going to work well, drop me a note in the comments on driftandruby.com and let me know. Well, that's all for this episode. Thanks for watching. For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.